So with us today is Carlo, who is a welder who runs an electronics and programming education company, Micronote.tech, and in his free time does uh, something which is very near and dear to my heart and is probably the like guilty reason that I don't admit to people, but the people who know me know why I love Rust. And that is he's been making some, he's been learning Rust and getting to work more with Rust by working on a variety of small games. That is so fun. And I love that. And I hope we get to see some of that in your talk. If not, that's all right. We probably can catch you on Twitter. Um, yeah, thank you for being with us. Uh, can't wait to to hear your talk, making Rust more accessible through games development. Hello, and welcome to my talk, Making Rust More Accessible Through Game Development. With this talk, I hope to open a discussion on how we can work to improve the accessibility of Rust to new programmers. In particular, I'll be focusing on game development. The first reason being because it encompasses most of the Rust programming that I do, and the second reason being that I believe that games influence a lot of young people to eventually pursue programming. Before I dive into the talk, I want to give you a little backstory on myself. I work at a drone company where I currently do generalist work, anything from PCB design to embedded programming to welding. In my free time, I run an education company where I post programming articles and videos. I also enjoy tinkering with electronics and building my own contraptions using 3D printed parts. Of course, I also like to program with Rust. I mostly work on games that are open source, but I also enjoy programming embedded devices. I've worked on a variety of games, but I also have a few long-term projects that I periodically work on. An important thing you should know about me is that I didn't go to school for computer science. Most of the early experience I have programming outside of introductory classes was gathered through hackathons, which are 24 to 36 hour university level programming competitions. These are great for networking and learning from peers, but they aren't great for learning important foundational coding habits, such as how to effectively collaborate, write tests and handle errors. As a result of this, I mostly worked on my own independent projects, and I wasn't very effective at collaborating on existing projects until very recently. I want to set some foundational knowledge of what goes into making a game for those that may be unfamiliar with the game development. Obviously, an important component of games is code, which defines entities in the game and specifies how they will interact. But there is also 2D and 3D art, sprites and models that make the game visually appealing to the player. Sounds are also important to make the game satisfying to play. Lastly, as someone who has done a few game jams, I understand the importance of quality design for a game, listing and linking the steps and actions the player will take through the game to make for a fulfilling experience. The point I want to stress here is that while programming is very important part of game development and can arguably be art on its own, as a game programmer, you can consider part of your task to be linking other types of art together into one unified interactive experience for the player to enjoy. This is why when writing open source games, we should not only consider how to make contributing code more accessible to programmers, but also streamline the process of contributing other forms as well, whether it be art, sound effects, music, design, writing, or anything else. The first game that I want to introduce to you is a long-term personal project of mine called Theta Wave. Through this game, I took my first steps into the Rust community. I initially made this game using the most popular game engine at the time called Amethyst. Amethyst had a wonderful and supportive community that helped me to get familiar with the engine and the Rust language. More recently, Development of Amethyst has been halted, and I've begun porting the project to the new most popular Rust game engine, the Bevy engine, implementing significant structural improvements to the code in the process. Here's a brief summary of the game. ThetaWave is a roguelite space shooter game. In the game, the player selects a character with unique stats and abilities and progresses through a series of randomly generated levels 
which consist of a variety of enemies that periodically spawn in different formations. At the end of each level, the player fights a difficult boss enemy before they can advance to the next level. Throughout the game, the player collects items, which can augment the rules of the game. Some items are simple and increase the stats of the player, and some are more complex and affect other aspects of the game, such as physics. As the player progresses through the game, they will accumulate many items which can synergize with each other. Like everything else in the game, these items are randomized in how they appear, which make each run through the game a unique experience. Like all games that will be mentioned in this talk, ThetaWave is open source and intended to be a good starting point for new Rust game developers to make their first contributions. It is still very much a work in progress, but I think that the game has very defined goals and a vision for what kind of game it will be. Before I continue, I need to give a brief explanation of an architectural pattern that both Amethyst and Bevy use, called ECS. ECS stands for Entity Component System. With ECS, programmers define entities as a collection of components. Then systems containing the game's logic can be defined that query for components and access and modify their data. Lastly, events can be created to share data between systems. ECS engines then can optimize and run these systems in parallel. This image is a screenshot of ThetaWave, containing many different types of entities. First, the gray and blue spaceship at the bottom is an entity representing the player character. It is made up of components that contain its core stats, sprite, and allows for it to interact with physics. Similarly, entities 2 and 3 are different kinds of e enemy entities. They contain a different component containing core stats for enemies, their sprite, a loot table, and a component that lets it interact with physics. Entity 4 is an item. It contains a component that describes what effect it has that will be applied to the player character when, it, when acquired. Entity 5 is an enemy projectile. It contains components that allow for it to move and describe the damage it will do to the player should it make contact. Instead of writing separate chunks of code that describe what enemies, players, items, and projectiles should do, with ECS, you typically write concise systems that manage components' data and interactions between different components. Before beginning work on ThetaWave in Amethyst, I had never experienced ECS before. In my experience, there was a bit of a learning curve to understanding how to effectively organize and design a game with an ECS engine, but after getting past this initial difficulty, I found that ECS enforced good organization and chunking of game logic compared to previous games I had worked on. Next, I'm going to provide some examples from ThetaWave that simultaneously demonstrate ECS and the technique I use to make one aspect of the game as modular as possible. In the game, there are many different enemies that behave in many different ways, and I intend on adding many more enemies with even more behaviors. This could easily turn into a lot of repeated code if not handled effectively and make the game messy and unapproachable to newer programmers. I've accounted for this problem by breaking complex behaviors down into smaller, more simple behaviors. While each enemy behaves in a unique way, they can share more simple, fundamental behaviors that compound into one unique behavior. For example, for my missile enemy, which homes in and moves toward the player, I give it two smaller behaviors, one to rotate to face the target, the player, and one to move forward. Both of these behaviors are run every frame and compound into the entity homing into the target like a missile should. Here's another example to illustrate shared behavior. The most basic enemy in the game, what I call the drone, moves straight down and resists movement in the horizontal direction. These behaviors are defined as enums called move down and break horizontal. Another enemy in the game called the strafer moves down and in a horizontal direction. These, there are two variants of this enemy that initialize going 
in opposite horizontal directions, but for the sake of this example, we'll be looking at the strafer that initially moves to the right. Like the drone enemy, the strafer moves down. The right variant of the strafer initially moves to the right, but upon impact with anything, the strafer reverses its horizontal direction. The behaviors of the strafer are called move down, move right, and change horizontal direction on impact. As you can see, both of these enemies have a shared behavior called move down. These behaviors are defined as rust enums that are stored in a vector that belongs to a component that is used in all enemies. This component is then queried by a dedicated system that uses a match statement to execute the appropriate function that performs the behavior the enum describes. Doing this every frame for every behavior in the vector using a loop compounds into the complex behaviors that the strafer and drone exhibit. The modularity of the behaviors allows for contributors to easily mix and match behaviors to create new, unique combined behaviors. This modularity also combines with RON configuration files to allow for contributors to create new enemies while touching little to no code. This enables people new to programming, Rust, or game development to create new enemies in the game without needing to understand the more complicated aspects of the language. One of the games I've contributed to in the past year is called Fish Fight. It's a really ambitious and bold project in the Rust game dev community. I want to share with you some of the approaches they've taken to make Rust and game development more approachable. First, let me give you a quick summary of the game. Fish Fight is a 2D shooter platformer game made by studio Spicy Lobster. The game can be played with up to four players, either locally or online. One of the aspects of Fish Fight that make it more approachable to new Rust game developers is its dedication to documentation. Located in the same repository as the game code is a directory called Book, where we keep source files for an MD book, containing resources about the game. This book contains everything from a gameplay explanation to art guidelines and walkthroughs of contributions. It is intended to be a one-stop resource for everything Fish Fight. I've worked a lot on this book and can say that it is still very much a work in progress and can at times be challenging to maintain. But I firmly believe that having a solid starting point for new contributors to get familiar with the game is essential if you want your game to be accessible to programmers of all experience levels. This brings me to the next aspect of Fish Fight that makes it an exceptional starting point for new Rust game developers. This is that Spicy Lobster actually pays developers outside of their core team for their contributions to Fish Fight. The way they do it is by identifying people who have shown interest and understanding in the game by making contributions. They then reach out to them and give them a small gig task and typically provide them with a $100 payment for their work. They emphasize that people who want to program purely for the money would get a full-time professional programming job, but people who have passion for creating games can pursue it on their own time and through this system earn compensation for their work. This not only allows for experienced programmers to be compensated for their time, but also lets newer programmers boost their experience and resume by being able to accurately say that they have been paid for game development work using Rust. Of course, there are many challenges to having a system like this. The first being that game developers often prefer to work on their own projects, whether it be their engines, tooling, or their own games. Of course, People also have lives and jobs outside of contributing to Fish Fight, so expecting them to commit to larger tasks and hard deadlines would be challenging. To account for this, Spicy Lobster is intentional about the tasks they give to outside contributors, avoiding critical tasks and tasks that block other work. They also don't have any hard deadlines, but may pass on work to others if people are no longer able to find the time or motivation to complete the task. I now want to discuss a learning plan that both I plan to use in ThetaWave and Spicy Lobster plans on using in their games. It uses difficulty levels with suggested contributions 
that help programmers ease into making more advanced contributions and helps them explore different parts of the game's code. The idea is contributors start with an easy contribution, one that may only consist of adjusting values in a configuration file. For ThetaWave, this could be creating a new enemy by copying an existing one and adding, removing, or changing a behavior that is already implemented in the game. For Fish Fight, this could be something like changing the musket to shoot faster and have more bullets. A medium contribution level for ThetaWave could be adding a new type of enemy by writing a new simple behavior to use in its compound behavior. For Fish Fight, it could be something like creating a new weapon that is similar to another in the game, but different enough to warrant modifying the Rust code instead of just values. And finally, a hard contribution in ThetaWave could be adding an enemy with a new, more complex behavior, such as spawning other smaller enemies. In Fish Fight, this could be adding a new weapon that is completely unlike anything in the game and essentially needs to be written from scratch. These are just some examples I thought of off the top of my head, but these levels of contribution could be explicitly defined in a book paired with the games to give valuable guidance to those looking for a path to contribute in. A big challenge whenever you are making contribution guides for projects in early stages of development like ThetaWave is that oftentimes the contribution process can drastically change. This means that if detailed material was written about how to contribute to a particular version of the game, and later that same part of the game is completely overhauled, your contribution guides will now be obsolete. Writing quality contribution guides is a lot of work, so having them be nullified with updates is very unproductive. It can also be actively harmful to the development of your game as well, because if you have written a lot of contribution material, you may resist uh, essential structural changes to the game that are ultimately necessary. There are some solutions to this, such as waiting for stable releases before writing contribution documentation, or otherwise having assurances that contributions for part of the game, such as enemies in ThetaWave, aren't subject to being overhauled even if other parts of the game are. I don't think there's an easy solution to these issues, but ultimately with this talk, I'm hoping to prompt others in the community to consider solutions to these issues and try them out in your own projects as we are. I interviewed Erland, the lead and producer at Spicy Lobster, in preparation for this talk. He emphasized that in general, the Rust game dev ecosystem simply needs more learning material about the fundamentals of Rust programming. I completely agree. Whether it be videos, articles, or contribution guides, any Rust game dev content that you would enjoy making would be greatly appreciated by this community. I'm going to end this talk by listing resources for those listening to this talk that haven't tried game development in Rust but are interested. First, arewegameyet.rs is a fantastic website that lists out resources and tools for making Rust games. It is a great place to start. GameDev.rs is a monthly newsletter where community members showcase what they are currently working on. RustGameDev.com. There is a Rust Game Dev podcast which features in-depth interviews with indie game developers creating titles with the Rust programming language. Olivia Ifrim wrote a detailed tutorial on creating a Sokoban game in Rust. Hands on Rust is a fantastic book on Rust game development by Herbert Wolverson that brings people from being new to Rust to making randomized dungeon crawler games. And lastly, Tantan creates entertaining programming videos, many which feature Rust. Thank you for attending the talk. If you are interested in my work, you can follow me at Carlos Sapina on Twitter. I hope you've learned something new about game development in Rust. Thank you so much, Carlo. That was amazing. I'm <laughs> that was so cool. I can I can like I don't I don't know where to get started because I loved all of it. Just you know how you were sharing um the different diff like how you touched on so many subjects I care about. I can't focus on one. Um like the different levels of contribution to get people contributing mm. or how important it is to pay contributors so they can, you know, like people have lives and yeah. and and things to do. That was so cool. Thank you so much. 
Yeah, it was a it was a really fun talk to put together. Uh, uh, it was I I, I interviewed I, uh, Erlen just uh, like two days ago. Now and he gave me a lot of great insight into what uh, he's doing with Spicy Lobster and those games. So it's uh, yeah, there's some really cool things happening in the Rust game dev community for sure. For sure, yeah, and and I think. You know, like you, you mentioned it so many times, not only the addressing the level of contribution and the commitment that people can take to actually take the time to contribute, um, but the compensation to me is something that's really incredible. And I, I wish we, I know it's very difficult to actually get the logistics done, Yeah. but that's so cool. The fact that, you know, it's also enabling um people who want to work in that field to have that on their cv on their resume that's so cool um i don't know if you have already tweeted out all of those uh yeah. resources okay cool yeah. because then we can and we can retweet them on the yeah. on the main account um yeah i'll send that out after after the show yeah perfect that would yeah. be great yeah yeah um, if you don't mind me asking how, like, cause I, I, I'm trying to, to pinpoint, I think you shared so many good things. What would you say? Oh, actually, could you share with us like what your first contribution was? I think that's a really like that kind of sets the tone for how you want other people to have an experience contributing, right? Yeah, so my, of course, um, in the first game I showed uh, Theta Wave, that was all my game. I started from the ground up. It started literally as a Hello World project. I had no idea what I was doing in Rust, uh, and it sort of turned, and I met uh, someone that um, in the Rust community last, or I guess two years ago now, who kind of really taught me a lot about um, being more professional with uh, collaborating and those kind of skills that, um, I certainly didn't learn anywhere else. Uh, but for uh, Fish Fight, my first contribution for that was, I think I made a little, uh, so it's, I made some armor. So it wasn't something that was in the game, but it was a very simple thing. So it was basically, if the character, it's like a little turtle shell that the character wears. So if you pick it up and you're attacked in the back, it'll block a hit where usually it's just a, it's a, it's a insta kill or something. So it was an inch. It was a, it was a very simple one, but it was also a, uh, a simple contribution. It was very, it was a very uh, unique thing uh, item that wasn't in the game yet. So it was, it was fun to make. And how was your experience with the team? Like wh when it you were was great. The it's, <laughs> yeah, they're they're uh, they were very open to ideas at at the time. They were when I made that contribution, they were just saying, Hey, in, they said, you know, come in the discord. It, Erlen was reaching out to all the people he met through various rust game dev projects. He said, come to the discord, pitch your item. We'll okay it probably. And you can go ahead and work on it and, you know, we'll uh, give feedback on it. And it was, it was a great experience. Um, and since then I've, I haven't, uh, contributed for the past few months, but I sort of moved on to, uh, writing some of that documentation for them. So I wrote uh, uh, a guide step-by-step -step how to add an item. It wasn't the turtle shell, but it was like a, it was like a rifle. So it was how to add something like that step-by-step. Uh, -step. And it was mostly just uh, changing values, not really, you know, generating new code. It's mostly just copy paste, change values, and you have a new item in the game. So it was sort of like a, what I'd consider maybe uh, like a level, or sorry, an easy or uh, medium contribution. Is that a, is that publicly available actually? Those docs. Yeah, or? I'll. Uh, you're talking about like the the guide that. Yeah. For yeah that that book is um, yeah it's it's hosted on a on GitHub pages with that uh, repository so it is accessible. Uh, and I'll, I'll make sure to tweet that out too when I tweet the other links. People are interested. Yeah, that sounds great because I think if someone does have, you know, like, 
not not any holdups, but maybe if they're a bit more scared to to contribute and but they want to learn stuff, I think even docs on how how it's done somewhere else are so valuable because mm. you can apply the same principles for your own project, right? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, well, you know, we're so grateful that you're here. We haven't gotten anything in the chat yet, but I, I guess you'll be around on the chat and you'll be on, yeah. on Twitter as well. If anybody wants to, to reach out, we'll retweet anything that you, you send our way because I think, you know, lots. Uh, I actually got asked in chat, someone DM'd me and said, you know, like, hey, I, I thanks for sharing the conference. I love it, but I've heard it's so hard to get into. And I, you know, the second... <laughs> your talk started i said this one's for you like go watch it this is exactly yeah. what it's about <laughs> so yeah. you know i think we're, we were so lucky to have you so thank you for joining us today and thank you for your great talk and all those great resources yeah it was my pleasure it was very very fun experience